Brilliant. What's this one here? <coughs> okay. Thank you very much. It's uh, a pleasure to be here and for the first uh, live event uh, for over a year. And welcome to those on, on the online who are sitting at home with a glass of wine or a, a can of beer, hopefully uh, enjoying the, the evening as well. Um, I'd like to talk to you obviously about light weighting of ADI material. Um, <clears throat> A lot of you already know ADI material and you know myself and you know the company ADI treatments. Um, but obviously I'm just going to, as ever, a little bit of promotion about the company and what ADI is and ADI treatments, uh, who we are. Um, and then go into a bit about what uh, we're looking at with regard to light weighting and why we're looking at light weighting. Um, obviously we have COP26 at the moment and obviously this is all about uh, the environment and climate change. And associated with that is also renewable energy, uh, reducing emissions, reducing, uh, reducing carbon dioxide. With that, we're looking at obviously uh, the change in uh, automotive industry, truck industry. And with that, we're looking at the uh, demise, unfortunately, combustion engines, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it with regard to the foundry industry, uh, where, you're, where you're working. But we're also seeing how, therefore, we need to adapt and look at new markets and how we can uh, uh, still move forward in the foundry industry. So ADI treatments have been around for, for close on uh, coming up to 30 years. Uh, time flies, as uh, Carl was saying, he's known me for over 20 years and uh, I've been in the, in the Midlands since 1997. Uh, we are situated just around the corner uh, in West Bromwich uh, but we also have a facility that we uh, are looking to open in Germany. Uh, we had a, 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 a company over there called ADI Technique, which we opened about uh, three years ago now. Um, we're a relatively small company, 24 of us with a turnover of three and a half million pounds. Uh, we're, our main business is os tempering of ductile irons. We also os temper steel and a bit of gray iron, uh, obviously carbonic ADI as well. And you can see some of the markets we get involved in here. Uh, Os timber steel, so this is all, all sort of pressings, a little bit of uh, bushes and likes of that. Os timber gray iron uh, in this market is sort of cylinder liner, cylinder blocks. Uh, and then we have ADI, which is obviously the main market that we're involved in, and carbonic ADI, which is a, a relatively new market, but very hard wear resistant products. ADI itself is obviously used throughout uh, many industries, with the core industry being the truck industry. Uh, but you can see we're in agriculture, uh, automotive, mining construction as well. A relatively old picture of our facility in West Bromwich, uh, just to the right of that picture is West Bromwich Albion. To the left is the M5 Junction 1. So easily accessible for football, easily accessible for high quality heat treatment and close to obviously a lot of extremely good foundries in the West Midlands and also accessible for foundries throughout the UK and the, and the further field. So when we started our business back in 1996, we put in uh, two small furnaces. Uh, we, we call them small furnaces. Uh, they're actually obviously for, for many heat treaters actually seen as quite large. These allow us to heat treat castings up to around about two tons individual and sort of dimensions of about a meter square and two meters in long. We then installed a further furnace on the back of the growth in renewable industries, uh, specifically wind turbines, but also tidal turbines and wave power. Uh, and that allowed us, we had to put in a larger furnace, which uh, allows us to heat you know, nearly two meter square products and about one and a half meters high and up to around about seven tons in, in weight. The facility we have in Germany is slightly smaller. Uh, as you say, that's to be installed, as you see there. Um, uh, that that sort of obviously uh, allows to to have a, quite a, a range of products that we can heat treat. But if we again go back a step, we look at what uh, types of irons are. We all know they're very well. Grey iron, 
compacted iron, malleable iron, and obviously ductile iron. And ADI is is the sort of new material on the block. It's been around for a long time. Don't get me wrong; it's been around, but it's still seen as a new material on the block. Um, ADI obviously allows us to uh, double the strength of a given ductile iron with whilst maintaining a lot, lot of ductility there as well. You can ask timber grey irons, as you've already seen, and there is a market for that, uh, in particular for cylinder blocks. Uh, again, there is a change in, in, in the world with regard to combustion engines, but in the meantime, there's still a, a good potential there, again, down to improving efficiency of engines. If we can make the cylinder block lighter by using an OS tempered material uh, whilst increasing efficiency, that makes the whole vehicle, the truck, the car more efficient and therefore much more environmentally friendly. Um, these are just obviously the main hardening process you have. You can either quench and temper, traditional way of, of processing irons and steel. Here you heat your castings or forgings, let's say if you're into the steel, up to say uh, 850, 900 degrees centigrade, quench them into an oil or water. This creates a martensite, which is very, very strong, but also very brittle. So you have to temper out the, the brittleness. With os tempering, uh, which you can apply steel, but is is mainly for uh, duct lines, grey irons. You gain your similar process. You heat the parts up to say 850, 900 degrees centigrade, but instead of quenching into a water or a oil, we quench into molten salt. This allows us to quench between sort of 200 degrees centigrade up to 400 degrees centigrade, and actually the os tempering occurs between 250 and around about 380, 390. Yes, you can ostemper at 400 or even higher, but in our uh, experience, when you quench at such a high temperature, you do see a reduction in certain mechanical properties, particularly elongation values and impact. <clears throat> the salt itself is a mixture of a, a potassium nitrate and a sodium nitrite, so both commonly available on the market, uh, um, and, and they work together. When you put them together as a 50-50, they melt uh, at about 150, so therefore we can use them between that 200 and 400 degrees centigrade. I think this is uh, always, uh, when I do these presentations, I'm not putting the onus back on the foundries, but the most important thing about ADI is we start with a good ductile line. So we work very closely, as you're all aware, with the foundries uh, to ensure that the castings that you manufacture, that we heat treat uh, for you and your customers, will achieve what is expected. Um, therefore, we work with you and, and uh, you work with us, so we ensure that we are a good partnership and we ensure that the customer gets what they need. And when I say that, there's a list of good things we need. We start with a consistent chemistry. Because we're involving a quenching process, is that we require hardenability. <laughs> Hardenability is not the same as hardness. If you want something of a high hardness, you add alloying elements like copper, maybe nickel to get a politic structure. Hardenability is adding these alloys so that when we quench them, we don't form perlite. We avoid, avoid the formation of perlite and, and we form this os tempered matrix, os ferrite. We like a good nodule count. Uh, we aim for around about a, a minimum of about 100 nodules per square millimeter. Obviously, again, we understand with foundries, as, as you know, uh, due to the, the cooling uh, characteristics of, of castings and the section thicknesses, uh, nodule count varies both with regard to uh, in size and with a, quant a number. But we obviously are always looking to get the good nodules and good nodule count. Good nodularity is important. And this is obviously uh, common sense when you're producing a good nodule or ductile iron. There's no point uh, producing a, a nodular iron with 50% nodules in it. That's not really a, a good nodular iron. So we again look for something that's got a nodule count to sort of eight, uh, nodularity around 85% plus. Uh, carbides, uh, shrinkage, obviously we want to minimize that as you do in a standard casting. We also want to do so when we're producing good ADI. And the final one there, consistent matrix, uh, is there mainly for components that are pre-machined. We're producing a, a tough material and machinists don't like machining tough materials. They like machining simple materials, uh, normally phytic grades of ductile iron. They, they're sometimes not even uh, happy to machine politic grades of ductile iron. 
Um, obviously, uh, ADI can be tougher to machine. It is machinable, um, but if we can machine it before, it obviously uh, makes a lot of life easier. And by giving a consistent structure, we can do that. So this is a, a, a small uh, video of how the heat treatment works. Uh, a very, uh, with, with, with the heat treatment, it's obviously just a combination of temperatures and times. The first part we do is just to warm the castings up. This is not a stress relief. This is just to warm up the parts to sort of 600 degrees centigrade. It's really for cost benefits. It allows us to uh, reduce the time that it takes to heat the parts back when we put them into the furnace. So this part of the furnace is called the purge. Uh, all of the heat treatment is done under a protective atmosphere, but this protective atmosphere reacts with oxygen with the air and can be uh, cause a, a bit of a bang if you mix them together. So what we have to do is remove all the air before we put into the back of the furnace. Once we're in the back of the furnace, obviously we heat the parts up to that 850, 900 degrees centigrade. The soak time is dependent on, the, on how heavy the, uh, the casting is, the section thickness of the casting. Once it's had its soak, the parts transfer over and are lowered into the quench. That transfer time is consistent, it's, it's uh, one minute. It soaks in that quench and the time depends on the temperature of the quench um, uh, more than actually how thick the section is because what we're trying to do is is cool the whole casting down to the temperature of uh, say 360 degrees centigrade before we start the transformation and once obviously as that's the case and obviously once everything starts transforming at once the soak temperature is is pretty common whether it's a 20 millimeter section or a 60 millimeter section but if we quench to a low temperature, everything happens a lot slower. We know in winter time, like we're having now, it's difficult to get up in the morning. It's difficult to, to drive because everything's a bit colder. It's the same with metals sometimes. They don't like cold. So everything happens a bit slower. Once the castings have gone through that process, we take them out and obviously we wash off the salt. If everything's done correctly, we will end up with a, a, a lovely looking ostempered microstructure. On the, on the left hand side, we have one of the lower grades of ostempered uh, ADI, uh, which is an ADI 800. This is a coarse microstructure uh, consisting of, of ferrite platelets and high carbon stabilized osnite. In this middle, we see an ADI 1400. This is a high grade of ADI. And this structure, we have a very fine matrix of, of, of the uh, ferrite needles. And those ferrite needles can actually contain some uh, precipitated carbides in them, more like a bainite that you'd see in steels. And the austenite volume fraction drops off considerably down from about 30% to 10 or, or even 5%. And on the, on the right hand side, we have the carbonic ADI. This is a, a grade where we actually purposely add in chromium and moly into the melt. Uh, a lot of foundries aren't appreciative of that because it's not uh, where they do. So normally we're, we're limited to the foundries that will make carbonic ADI. There are other ways of making carbonic ADI that don't involve using chrome and moly. Uh, that's generally through uh, the inoculation process to try and form iron-based carbides in the melt, like a chill carbide, and then use that uh, as a carbide uh, to get the additional wear resistance into the casting. So if we do this correct, as I say, ADI offers a unique uh, combination of mechanical properties. And the whole point of this is really to, for the iron foundries that are producing ductile iron, uh, to go out to the marketplace and say, you're using cast steel, using uh, welded fabricated steel, you're using aluminium uh, in certain cases, uh, we can replace that with this ADI material because we can offer something that's got very high strength, very high ductility, very high fatigue pro, uh, uh, fatigue resistance, very high impact resistance. Uh, we also look uh, on, on occasion, obviously, and you'll see here as well in the presentation, to, to not replace ductile iron, but obviously to allow designers to take the, that ductile iron casting and reduce the weight of the product or upgrade the properties by using ADI. So here we have the general EN 5064 standards, uh, 800 to 510, all the way to 1600, 1300 grade. As uh, most of you know, 
we can achieve those grades of ADI by altering the heat treatment. The foundry manufactures a casting to the chemistry that we sort of discuss with you and recommend and we agree on. You then, we ostemper that. And just by changing our heat treatment, we can offer the ADI 800, 900, 1400. So once you've made that casting, uh, we can alter the heat treatment to change the grade. And it can be the case that obviously a foundry, uh, we make a, a product, the customer tries it out in the uh, on the vehicle or in the field on the on an ag agricultural wear machine a part, and then decides is uh, decides that yeah it's not wear resistant enough or I need more ductility and we can alter the grade. The foundry don't have to change anything. We just alter the heat treatment. So say so we can see the ADI is used in most market, and here here are a few structural ex uh, examples. So we have the very large uh, planet carriers. Uh, this one's in a wind turbine, but we use planet carriers from uh, even the small planet carriers for 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 general gearboxes and I say all the way up to industrial uh, uh, and, and wind turbines. And at the moment, again, we talk about light weighting. There's a lot of projects going on with uh, in the in the wind turbine market mm -hmm. to take out weight. And therefore, gearbox is obviously one of the big weights uh, product in in the gear in, in in a wind turbine. So if they can reduce the gearbox weight, then it's obviously advantageous to them. We have in the middle a, a quick hitch, uh, which is obviously used on uh, excavators. And on the right hand side, you can see an axle that's used in the tracked system of uh, combine harvesters and on uh, tracked tractors as well. And then say we can go to the other extreme where we can go to the wear resistant materials. So we have typical uh, agricultural wear parts. In the middle, we have uh, components we use for cutting. Uh, we, we use these obviously on, on, on hedges, but we can also cut uh, uh, wood as well. So the uh, products like Timberwolf, although not Timberwolf itself, but obviously those wood cutter machines can use ADI for the chipping of the, of the, of the actual uh, branches. And on the on the right, we can see here typical excavator track components, sprockets, idlers, uh, rollers. Just a, a, a sort of a, a bit of more of an example, and I'll come back to this one again a little bit further into the presentation. But we can see here the uh, four point link used on a uh, truck, uh, man trucks, and obviously a, a very high integral safety critical part. And then on the other, again, the other extreme, we have here a, uh, a cone used in the, in the uh, steelworks where the crushed coal is passed over that uh, cone, uh, acting as a filter, basically. It's taking out anything that's oversized and the pressure uh, over, the, over the filter actually breaks down the uh, excess coal so it will then fit through the filter. And you can see here the advantage that we uh, saw from going from a stainless steel uh, to an ADI, uh, a factor of four increase in life. So uh, this is this is where ADI can see uh, some of the advantages for for different markets. This is a, an old picture, but obviously we can see here the uh, markets ADI is looking to replace and is replacing. As I say, traditionally we've looked to replace steel. Uh, and reduce the weight of the steel components, but we also look at uh, aluminium if where need be, or uh, and also where people want to upgrade oh. duct line castings as well. Uh, these are obviously taken from the EN 1564, typical properties, technical data that's available to the engineers to use when they're designing. Obviously, uh, it's very simple to say uh, just to look at the yield strength and start designing around that but obviously designers also want to know uh, fatigue resistance uh, they want to know impact they want to know uh, uh, fracture toughness so they can then design that part safely for the vehicle and obviously we can see here the wear resistance of adi Wear is a funny uh, thing to look at because you have all types of different wear. You have abrasive wear, you have impact wear, you have corrosive wear, and obviously everything acts slightly differently. So you're finding that uh, um, optimum material for the wear resistance uh, can take some time. Uh, n it's not necessarily that you just put the hardness material in. You know, hardness 
you think, oh, this is hard, therefore it's going to be wear resistant. If it's a, a product that's going under a lot of impact, then you might want something that's a little bit softer to absorb that impact whilst giving the wear resistance. So ADI is obviously uh, a, a, a very versatile mat uh, material and certainly uh, very good for looking to replace steel where we can offer immediately a weight saving. And obviously against aluminium, there are opportunities to reduce the weight as well. Obviously uh, when designers often look for lightweight, the, the, the go-to material can be aluminium because we all know aluminium density is the density of aluminium is, is, is very is a lot lower than iron and significantly lower than steel but obviously when you look at the strength of aluminium it's limited even through the heat treatments whereas with with iron and steel but with ADI we can we can get some very good strengths out of that and allow a designer to actually manufacture a casting that fits into a space where with aluminium you might have to bulk it up to fit into that space and it gets to such a size it doesn't fit in the space and therefore ADI opposite. But as I say, uh, what I've gone through all this but what, I, what, what, what I'm trying to say uh, and talk about is light weighting. Um, as we move uh, to the sort of new uh, markets, uh, the new um, green uh, uh, world that we want, we all want to live in. Uh, part of that is the development of obviously um, the, the, the battery and the hybrids and the electric vehicles. And with that, obviously, we have to look at uh, the vehicles themselves. And there are unfortunately going to be, as you say, over a period of time, the potential is the combustion engine will uh, slowly come to to an end. Uh, I think it's going to take probably longer than it might, might, might we all might think. But uh, there is a call, obviously, from governments in the world to to change the way that the automotive industry looks uh, at uh, manufacturing of vehicles. So as we move to an electric world, um, we have to think. Okay, when we when we go out now in our car. Uh, assuming we're not all driving electric vehicles now, one of the key key parts is to just pop into the shell or the SO garage and top up with fuel. We don't have to think about the range of, 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 of well, obviously a few weeks ago when there's no fuel in it, we might have to think about it. But nowadays we, we don't really consider, oh, I'm going to run out of fuel. I can just go and fill up here. When we go to electric vehicles, there is a range and I have a, a plug-in hybrid and it says I can do 14 miles. It never does 14 miles, it does about six because I turn the lights on and I, t I turn on the, the heating. And it's the same with electric vehicles. An electric vehicle says I can do 300 miles, but sometimes because of what your vehicle is doing, it may not do that. So we have to think about how can we increase the range of these vehicles? And yes, there's battery technology, but we also have to look at the vehicle itself. And this is where we start to say, OK, we need to make a vehicle lighter. How can we how can we do this? And this is where we start to say, OK, let's look more at the suspension at the chassis of the vehicle, whether it be a, a car, whether it be a van, whether it be a, a truck, whether it be a, a, a locomotive on a for a train, whether it be a tank or a military application. All of these, we have to start to look at how to take the weight out to maybe improve the range of a, of a, of a battery assisted ve a vehicle. So what we can see here is a typical example of, of reducing the weight. So on the left-hand side, we have the conventional steel fabrication, 15 kilograms. On the right, the ADI version. Okay, it's only one kilogram. You have two of these on a vehicle, so you're saving two kilograms. It doesn't sound much, but two kilograms is still a weight saving. And then you could look at other applications, let's say on this vehicle. Obviously we're not just, uh, we're looking at weight saving here, but with weight saving can come other advantages, uh, especially going to a casting. Because going to casting, we can reduce costs elsewhere. We have a pattern compared to lots of tooling required to make pressings and forgings that come together. With a casting, it's one piece. With a steel fabrication, it could be four, five, six pieces. Those have to come together at one time and be welded. So you need to have the welding inspected. So going to casting adds other advantages. 
This is the example you, you I, I showed earlier. Uh, this is the four point link. Uh, it's been in production now for uh, around about uh, 15 years, I'd say. So obviously I can't say this is a, a obviously a, come through electrification of, of vehicles, but the reduction of weight is still uh, where this market was looking for. And we have to look forward and say, okay, we're still looking to reduce the weight. So on the left, we have obviously the, uh, the it was a forged steel. Uh, so those eyes where the suspension, uh, the, the, the brackets are work, obviously forged solid, they're machined out with the cast version, they're cast hollow. So merely a, a, a saving in machining. And then obviously the overall compart, uh, product, because we can use forgings, uh, we can use uh, cores, allow us to cast this lighter. And we end up with something that's 20, nearly 20 kilograms lighter. So these go on a, 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 an according to a transit van vehicle. And as I said, uh, we are always looking how to, and, and engineers are always looking how to reduce weight on vehicles to improve the efficiency of the vehicle. This could be as, as it is now with improving the, the range of a vehicle when you're just driving on petrol or diesel. But going forward, as we move into the electric uh, era, the same is requirement. How do we improve the range of that vehicle? So on, on here, what we can see is a, a traditional uh, control arm. On the left-hand side, we have the, um, the cast version, a politic fritic grade, so a typical 507. And on the right, we have the redesigned ADI version. And you can see uh, the, the, the sort of nearly a three kilogram saving in weight. So again, two of these in a vehicle, six kilograms of saving. That's a fantastic weight saving, which allows the customer to see uh, opportunities with improved efficiency of the vehicle. Uh, as I say, currently that comes through improved range or reduced uh, emissions on the vehicle. And we have a similar example here, <clears throat> excuse me, of, of a steering nickel, uh, steering nickel, steering knuckle uh, for again, uh, a, a transit van style vehicle. Um, we've produced these as well for electric vehicles. Um, but this is again on, on a, a, a current uh, combustion engine. Uh, on, the, on the left, we see the uh, cast option at about 11 kilograms. And on the right, we have the ADI version at around nine kilograms. So again, a two kilogram saving. So around about a 25% saving on that component, 20% saving, two on the vehicle, uh, a significant weight saving. The, the examples we've seen so far have been based on, on trucks and mid-sized vehicles, but there's no reason why we can't adapt this for the petrol engine for those, uh, the petrol engine, for the small uh, uh, cars, for your, uh, your, your uh, Ford Fiestas, your uh, uh, Ford um, cars, your, I don't know, so many, I'm driving a Mercedes, uh, all of them anyway. Uh, we ha they, they, they work on very similar systems. They all need knuckles. They've all got uh, control arms generally. And this one is for a small car. Um, this is work that was uh, done with a, a UK foundry actually. And on the left, we see a, the fabricated version as it was in 2.7 kilograms. And the right is a design version ADI, 2.4 kilograms. Okay, not a significant waste saving, but still a weight saving. And other advantages came from the fact you have, again, a single one piece casting. You don't need to be, bring four or five parts together. Uh, so you, it makes uh, an easier, uh, reduced supply route. So supply chain becomes better for the customer. We have a, a front up right here uh, for a uh, prestigious vehicle. Um, the weight here is 7.5 kilograms, and we can see here the this this is a converted from a steel forging, so a considerable reduction in weight for that product. And other advantages you can see here: low tooling. Obviously, as I say, uh, forging toolings uh, uh, are generally more expensive than casting tooling, uh, so we can see advantages. This is a, a front upright for a specialized vehicle. Um, and again, we have seen a, a, an improvement of going from a duct line to an ADI because they can design the part a lot uh, with, with thinner sections, reducing the weight considerably.
This is a trailing arm for going for a vehicle. And again, we can see originally it was a steel forging. Uh, going to an ADI has reduced the cost, reduced the, uh, the, the, the tooling, uh, and, and, and obviously reduced the weight as well. We're looking now uh, at other markets, and, and it's the same requirement, reducing weight. Uh, you wouldn't think that obviously on these little excavators and, 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 and material handling machines that you need to reduce the weight, weight is important. But if they can take the weight out of, of certain parts, it does help them a lot because they can reduce the cost. They can replace some of the more complicated parts with lighter. And if they need weight, they can add it with, with the weights that they put on the back, the gray iron weights, and just take some lower cost components and, and, and do it that way. So this is a tipping link. And you can see here again, it was a ductile line casting, but converted to ADI. There was no weight increase by going to an ADI, so they kept the weight same, but they've improved in performance greatly. And this is one thing that's important we're seeing uh, with some of the defense vehicles we get involved with. Uh, sometimes they design it for, with a duct line casting, and then they use the ADI version, which allows them then to use a, uh, put that as a higher loaded axle. So that means they can convert and use it on a bigger vehicle without actually having to make any significant design changes to the vehicle itself or the axle. This is a forklift truck component, uh, a motor carrier. So again, initially designed a duct line casting, but uh, uh, requirements meant it need to be a lot stronger. But again, there's no need to start to make heavier castings or, or increase the weight of the product. By using the ADI, they managed to keep the weight down and where it was beforehand. Uh, Interframe casting. So we're getting some, some, some of, of larger castings here. And again, yeah, we, we, these are sort of quarter of a ton, 275 kilograms. But again, the customer's looking at how to keep the weight down. Because if he can reduce the weight, it improves, it improves the, his, his, his uh, vehicle, it allows him to take more load, it allows him to improve the efficiency of the vehicle, reduce the uh, emissions of the vehicle. I think everybody uh, who, who's, who's seen my presentation before will, will recognize this one. Uh, it is an American example. I talk about ADI replacing aluminium. Um, we have one example of a engine mount in the, it, that we have done in the past where we replaced an aluminum engine mount. But this is one that was still in operation over in North America. Uh, it is a truck hub, a trailer hub. Uh, and again, on the left, you see the aluminum. On the right, you see the ADI version. Uh, yes, it's redesigned to suit the, obviously the ADI casting, but it is lighter than the aluminum. And this is, obviously uh, gives gives the customer a, a great advantage because again it's a lighter component it allows them to take a bit more load on the on the trailer because he can reduce everything around it this is uh, the final slide i think uh there's a couple of things i would like to add as well before we we, we finish but as again ADI is a unique material but the most important part about making good ADI is working with you uh, the foundries to ensure that the material we're given to uh, support your customers will meet their demands. We're talking about light weighting uh, to improve the uh, the efficiency of a vehicle. And to do that, obviously, the designers will make use the properties of the ADI so they can cast this part as thin as possible, as light as possible. But we have to ensure that when you, uh, the family, make that casting, it, it meets those, you know, those those good standards that you do now. So when we heat treat it, they get what they want. So it, it's working together as a team. The engineers who are designing the part have to know that the casting is going to be the quality that they they expect, as they always do from the foundry, and that when we do the heat treatment, they'll get that material out of it. Obviously, we're talking about ADI light weighting, and and this isn't doesn't you know um, happen without you going out there and promoting that material. But also, 
I think what we have to also work here is 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 use the new technologies that are out there. ADI is not a new technology. We've been talking, as you know, with you for the for 20 plus years. And obviously we have seen great inroads and we have seen a lot of products change from steel to ADI. We are seeing uh, products still being changed from steel to ADI. We're seeing duct line castings being uh, upgraded to ADI so that you're still keeping the castings. But there are obviously new technologies which are coming out or you're using now, the use of 3D printing. Uh, this allows much more uh, complex parts which haven't been you know, looked at before uh, to be manufactured. It allows designers and founders more freedoms to make those uh, uh, parts in the, in the products and the parts that they wouldn't look at. They would say, I can't make that because there's no way I can make a core or uh, there's no way I can make the pattern to suit that product. 3D printing is one of those sort of new markets. Again, it's not new, but it allows founders to uh, take advantage and combine that with new te uh, technologies like ADI or, or just duct line castings to say, I can make new products that suit what that designer wants. The use of all the new uh, uh, 3D um, measuring technologies to allow uh, products to be to look at and design so they get high quality products out there. So ADI as a material which we've worked out with for you before allows designers the opportunity to produce lightweight components but we can combine that now with all the new technologies that, the, that you have at your uh, available to you with 3D printing with uh, uh, new FEA packages that allow you to design uh, very close all the, all the casting technologies, the solid um, the casting uh, methods. So allow you to see very accurately what's going on with regard to the casting process to allow us all to work together to design lightweight products, which can help the designers produce a sort of uh, uh, more efficient vehicles as they move forward. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Um, before before we go any further, I will ask um, if there is any questions for Aaron. Um, I'll I'll ask the floor uh, here at Churchill's if there's any any questions from the audience for Aaron. No, <laughs> everyone just wants the buffet, I think, Aaron. Yeah, so. <laughs> you got a couple of questions, Dave. What would be the section that you think ADI? What would be the heaviest? Yeah, heaviest section. Well, um, I don't know if you hear, but we, 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 um, we always said 10 millimeters. But we have worked with, uh, we've seen work done in Finland where they've managed to get up to 300 millimeters. And we have recently heat treated some blocks that are 250 millimeter cube and through us tempered those. But obviously, again, it's using these new, I wouldn't say, it's, not, I won't say the word, yeah, world is. You could argue it's cheating because you can chill blocks quite easily to assist you with manufacturing, obviously, getting that nodule count up and nodularity up, even those heavier sections. And that allows for obviously assists us with regards to heat treatment. But again, using the uh, sort of accessing all the, all the new technologies of inoculations to allow you to do that. Obviously, on the other end of on the thinner sections, yeah, that's down to the foundry technology again. What is feasible with the casting technology using 3D printing? Can you cast two millimeters uh, or less? And, and yes, you can. Obviously, then then we can also temper those as well. When you're casting very thin sections, obviously control of Ensuring you don't get chill in them is very important on those very thin sections. Because if you get chill in them, it's very easy to, through the handling process, to damage those castings. So obviously going for the thinnest sections is, is also very high controls. That's great. I've got one, one other question um, here as well. It's related, I think it's the same, same part. Which area of the casting do you target to get optimum properties? Would it be a specific area or to just turn around and look at the casting. So I think in the cylinder block, for example, which you target the variance, 
for the optimum property of any sense. Okay. Sorry, but yeah. Very, very, very minimal variation throughout the section. Um, we're trying to get the, the, the properties uh, throughout the whole area. We do understand, obviously, uh, that, as I say, some foundries uh, have um, on have difficulty allowing because they, they, they only have copper on site, so they can't have it there. So we do understand that obviously, and this is again, communication with the foundries. We talk about uh, getting the properties the same in all sections. It may not be necessary. It may only be necessary to, through Ostember, a few millimeters or the surface of the structure. Because when you look at large panic arrows, uh, it's only the surface where the high stresses are. So you might be able to just dos temper with, a, with even if it's 200 millimeters thick, just use something that's got little a, a very minimal alloying, just get the surface transformed to get the ADI transformation of surface. Yeah, like case uh, almost a case hardening. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that really needs a lot of discussion and communication between the designer and, and the founder and the, and the ADI to ensure that you know everybody knows what they're getting. Okay. Thank you. I'd check with Richard to see if he's had any further questions directly. Or... Hello, hello, Richard. Could you just confirm if you had any other questions directed to you? I've got nothing at all in the chat at the present moment in time. Okay, okay. So Richard's not getting any questions. I've I've got one for you, Aaron. So um, uh, obviously, lots of ductile iron processes out there that founders are using uh, across the board. So, are there any preferred sort of treatment processes? Um, or any that are better than others that give you the, the substrate that you need we, we, for ADI treatment? We haven't, no, I have to say we haven't come across it for any specific. Obviously, um, machine moldy castings are normally, uh, yeah, heavy section castings, you've always got issues with, with do get issues with inoculation and the surface effect uh, because of the slow cooling rate. So obviously, you know, these and high volume castings normally have a better control systems in place, which allow to get more consistent castings and low volume hand molded castings but obviously again boundaries in have, are, are there to ensure that the quality of casting they produce will always be consistent so even if you've got a hand molded casting where you know you've got some uh, uh, surface effect and lower nodules and possibly uh, you know, not, not as good a nodularity is always consistent it should be consistent Okay, great. Thank you. I don't know from first-hand experience, anyway, Aaron, that you're always on hand to help and and assist. So um, the phone is not isolated. Um, you, you're always there. I, I, I do. I mean, as you say, when in the background, an <laughs> ADI part, unfortunately, we're limited to temperature and time, so there's not much we can do wrong. So if there is something wrong, it normally comes from the fact that the family is still. There's a lot of things that go into a casting. Yeah. Uh, and normally we can come down to, to you know, we, we find there's something that we can find within the casting that causes an issue. Um, we often, unfortunately, one of the, the, the recent issues we're seeing with, with, with uh, castings is a lot of spiky graphite occurring. And we, we don't know why that is, but uh, obviously the, the, we seem to see a bit more founders of spiky graphite, which I assume is down to a, an inoculation issue, a magnesium issue. Yeah, yeah. Or, or it might be the the sort of availability of steel and and tramp elements that we're all probably seeing uh, in in our in our uh, in our cast irons at the moment yeah. in the back scrap, uh, which is a, is a is a real issue, isn't it? And availability of steel. I, 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 yeah, going back, obviously, again, working with founders, and we're aware that obviously as time goes, you know, there, there is a need for you know, fitting with what founders can get hold of with regard to raw materials. Yeah. It may, the steel strap may not be as high quality, but we work with the founders to ensure that, again, as long as we're aware that things are changing, we can work with the founders to ensure we offer the, the, uh, the treatment. Great. Great. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions um, at this stage, so I'm just going to hand over to my colleague, Dave, for the vote of thanks. Yeah, just, Aaron, it's absolutely brilliant. Fantastic lecture. Absolutely fantastic lecture. Fantastic lecture, really, really good.
Thanks, Aaron. Okay. Cheers. Um, well, I know everyone is sure Churchill's is eagerly awaiting the, the buffet uh, for the last 12 months anyway. Um, so um, I will I will close the meeting today, uh, tonight. And thank you very much.